utmost gratitude to be able to live, work on their beautiful land. So hopefully by now we're all familiar with Zoom. <laughs> we have um, we have probably been through a couple of these Zoom webinars, but if not, I um, just wanted to give a little bit of a background on some of the functions of the webinar and um, so that we, we will be able to take your questions and comments. Um, we'll go through the housekeeping. Here's a look at the agenda. We have a history of the Indigenous Caucus, moving to the path of um, the National Indigenous Collaborative Housing Incorporated. Uh, the acronym is Nietzsche. And then moving to Nietzsche activities currently, the three vectors of Nietzsche, and then we'll move to the question and comment period. So um, moving on. So here's just a quick, oops, sorry. This is a quick overview of functions of Zoom. If you would like to raise your hand, you have that option. And we ask that all of the questions and comments be put in the Q&A section in, in the Zoom function. And we have allowed an hour and a half for this webinar. The invite says two hours. We had that just to have some extra space, but it, we hope to wrap up by 3.30 p.m. Eastern. So I am going to pass it along to Margaret Foe the CEO of the Aboriginal Housing Management Association and President-elect for CHRA to provide a brief history of the Indigenous Caucus. Over to you, Margaret. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, in the language of my Simsian ancestors, Toyaksim, thank you everyone for taking time out of your busy lives to be here today. I think, uh, you know, when I say that, I don't say it lightly. I know that each and every one of us uh, that work on the front lines uh, are doing it for uh, to support and, and bring the much needed services to our peoples that are residing in urban, rural and northern communities, uh, some by choice and some by necessity. And so I really want to, to take a moment to acknowledge and honour each and every one of you for being here and for investing your valuable time to listen and learn a little bit about where Nishi, the National Indigenous Collaborative Housing Incorporated, has come from and where we are going. Uh, and I want to just open up by saying that it really is about giving voice to the people. Uh, it is not about any one individual. It is not about any organization. Uh, stands alone. It really is about a grassroots movement from our, our communities that have said that urban Indigenous people deserve an equal seat at the economic tables of this country. Uh, and, and that doesn't matter whether you're First Nations, Métis, Inuit status, non-status, or status unknown, uh, because we know that the legacy of colonialism has marginalized our Indigenous populations far and wide and is undisputed. Uh, and so uh, we know that this country, uh, through acts of reconciliation and uh, wanting to honor uh, legislation such as UNDRIP and in British Columbia, the Declaration to the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, uh, which forces all governments to honor and respect the many articles under the United Nations declarations on the rights of Indigenous peoples, is about bringing those voices together and helping our communities meet their, their, their housing needs, their basic needs uh, in a way that is not only culturally safe, but also trauma informed. Uh, our people deserve nothing less than that. And so what we're talking about with the evolution of Nishi is about bringing that collective voice into one room. And so it started much, much earlier than the Indigenous Caucus. It can be dated back to the 1970s. It can be dated back to Colin organization. But for this purposes of this webinar, we're talking about the housing providers across this country, housing and support providers, because I want to acknowledge that we wouldn't be providing the kind of service that our community needs if we didn't have the supportive services that comes from agencies like our friendship centers across this country, health agencies and other services that provide the essential wraparound supports that many of our community require. But most of us have been on the ground for nearly 50 plus years now. 
And we, we have come together on and off over the decades under various governments to bring a unified voice around what our communities need. And we all know that in the 1990s, the federal government got out of investing in, in housing uh, full blank, full, 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 uh, um, uh, court, uh, and so they only got back into the game uh, in 2018 with the national housing strategy. Um, but we knew that we needed to constantly battle to bring our Indigenous voices together so that we could speak as one. Uh, I, I just want to say that I, I had an opportunity in 2019 to uh, meet with the Aboriginal Housing Northern Territory, uh, the first of its kind in Australia, and Elder Helen uh, Frio Firth had said, uh, united we stand and divided we fall and that there is more that unites us than ever can divide us and so that is the very underpinning of how we have come together over the decades uh, you know certainly in 2012 the Aboriginal Housing Management Association worked with our national partners and our international partners to pull together the 2012 World Indigenous Housing Conference where it became abundantly clear that not only here in Canada but in any colonized country Indigenous peoples end up being marginalized, uh, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll frame that as a sentiment that I heard through another agency called the International Initiative on Mental Health Leadership under the Fararetta Group, which is a, a culmination of Indigenous leadership that came together to talk about how Indigenous people across the world end up the highest on the worst scales and the lowest on on the, the best scales. And so if we put that into perspective of, of housing, we know that most Indigenous people are overrepresented in, in access to housing homelessness. Uh, we're overrepresented in addictions, incarceration rates, in, in early deaths, in uh, um, uh, um, low graduation rates, low post-secondary rates, uh, high apprehension rates. And, you know, so that shifts us to the highest on the lowest scales, you know, uh, we have high High, high incarceration rates, we have high, high uh, um, apprehension rates, we have high early death rates, you know, and that is a common theme that happened across the world. And so when we came together in 2012, the common theme was that we as Indigenous people need to create that united and, and common voice. And so in truth, Nishi may have culminated in 2022 uh, being incorporated in December and with the declaration being signed on November 25th, uh, but the, the actual activities of this date back decades uh, past the World Indigenous Housing Conference uh, and through right up until uh, 2022 where we came together on November 25th in Vancouver, and it was largely supported by the Indigenous Caucus. And the Indigenous Caucus came together under the umbrella of the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association because, as Justin Marchand had said, there was no other national united organization that was giving voice to urban Indigenous housing providers. Uh, and CHRA opened their, their forum, their annual Congress, to, to help support the gathering of Indigenous voices. And so we got together, you know, through 2012, 2013, formed the Indigenous Caucus, invited all urban Indigenous housing providers and non-Indigenous housing providers because because we know that there is a good percentage of Indigenous population across this country that access housing and support services through non-Indigenous services as well. So we were really well positioned uh, within CHRA to garner the best kind of voice and collective powers that we could across the sector. Uh, and that began in 2012. We started having conversations about what was needed to bring that united voice to the government, to try to, to coax government to understand the need for federal investment into housing. Uh, I think you guys, if you haven't seen them, you'll see that over the last three to five years, there's been some scathing reports from the parliamentary budget offices, uh, there's been a commission struck under the the human the Huma Commission. Uh, they also struck the National Housing Council. Through the Indigenous Caucus work, uh, we were able to bring that a united voice to all of those forums, and all of those forums led to one outcome. 
And that outcome was the need to create a national Indigenous housing centre that could help focus the funding structure uh, for the federal government. And so we finally, over I would say probably the last two or three years, have had multiple meetings. Uh, COVID made it, uh, you know, harder and sometimes easier for us to get together. Um, but the Indigenous Caucus generously uh, funded the ability for us to get together, not only at annual Congress with CHRA, but also to come together. Uh, I think it was in 2018, we got together in Vancouver um, with a number of Indigenous housing leaders from across the country to talk about forming an official for Indigenous by Indigenous National Housing Centre. And in fact, through CHRA's Ind um, Indigenous Caucus, we tabled a FIBI submission to the federal government uh, in around 2019 that said we need to have a dedicated standalone housing entity that can honour the voices of urban Indigenous peoples across Canada. And that included urban, rural and northern communities. We were very specific in that language because we wanted to define the distinction of what we do as urban housing leaders and housing and support leaders as a distinct voice separate from the three distinctions. We always have said that the federal government needs to honor their, their responsibilities to, to be in consultation in government to government relationships with First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and we stand by that. But what often gets missed when we narrowly focus on just a distinctions-based approach is the 80 plus percent of our population that we know lives in urban, rural and northern communities that need our support and have been benefiting from our supports for over 50 years now. And so we fought really hard over those years at those various tables through the Parliamentary Budget Office, through the Huma Commission, through the National Housing Council roundtables uh, to be able to advocate for the creation of a national centre. And it wasn't just through the Indigenous Caucus. We know that other agencies like the OFIFC, uh, the Ontario, uh, F Ontario Federation of Indigenous Friendship Centre, um, brought together a number of stakeholders a number of years ago as well, uh, including the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, uh, Friendship Centers, uh, a number of other agencies that have been advocating for things alongside the Indigenous Caucus. And so on November 25th, 2022, just last year, uh, the Indigenous Caucus received funding to host a summit of sorts uh, that we held in Vancouver. We brought together about 20 individual national uh, leaders from across the country to talk about what it would be like to create a national center. And we founded that on four key principles that I want to, to, to read to you right now, because I think it's important to acknowledge that, as I said in my opening, this is not about one individual. This is not about one organization. It is about putting aside our personalities. It is about putting aside our political differences and coming together in one unified voice so that we can actually uh, give credibility credibility to a national organization. So we had four underlying principles that brought us together to form Nishi, and that was the respect for each other and upholding self-determination and Indigenous sovereignty. The signatories to our declaration are autonomous Indigenous organizations that form a coalition to achieve the housing purposes of this coalition. Second, through the development of culturally appropriate housing and services, we support the retention and revitalization of our diverse cultures through our respective cultures and traditions, ways of knowing and being and respect for the land. Third, to be respectful of each other and all life. And fourth, to ensure that housing is provided to all urban, rural, northern Indigenous peoples on an equitable and as needed basis in an Indigenous holistic manner. And those four key principles underline the evolution of Nishi, and it underlines our transparency and inclusionary process in which we have invited you all to be here today so you can learn more and ideally support the process. So I'm going to leave off with that right now. I think I, I've probably dived into more details than Kimberly expected, but I'll leave off with that brief history and turn it over to Kimberly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Yes, I, I really appreciate that. We will get into a little bit more detail about the pathway to Michi and, um, and the principles of, of 
the creation of the declaration for the coalition at, that guide how Nietzsche has been established. But thank you so much, Margaret. I know you're very busy and I <laughs> really appreciate the time that you took today to provide that really important brief history of the Indigenous Caucus and how it led to today. So um, I wanted to just go over a little bit of the, it's been a year now almost since the budget 2022 was announced and a lot of activity had happened in that from the time of the announcement to where we are today. And so um, going back about a year ago, there was a consultation that happened with the National Housing Council Indigenous Working Group and the Indigenous Caucus was part of that. Then I was hired in February. From that, the budget was announced in April and we heard of the 300 million over five years to co-develop and earn Indigenous housing strategy. So from there, we had been working quite a bit with the government, having um, meetings with CMHC on the delivery of the 300 million and figuring out a pathway forward. So with that, we um, the Indigenous Caucus had decided to host what Margaret had mentioned earlier, the Summit of Indigenous Housing Providers, and we decided on hosting it in the fall. And that was kind of the turning point for the Indigenous Caucus to the coalition and Nietzsche. So just things happened pretty quickly with um, the budget announcement all the way up until the um, the present day. But so um, speaking about the National Indigenous Urban, Rural and Northern Stakeholder Gathering, we had engaged and um, decided to have it open to urban, rural and Northern Indigenous housing providers and, and service providers. And um, right before that time, we did hear that the the allocation of the 300 million went from CMHC to Indigenous Services Canada. They wanted to create a technical advisory committee and had asked the Indigenous Caucus to provide two members to serve on that committee. So a lot was happening at that time and there was a lot of going back and forth with the government. We were doing our best to keep on our toes and we were steadfast and committed to doing what we promised we would do, and that would be to come together and um, decide on what the next steps would be for Earn Indigenous Housing and the strategy. So we hosted the gathering November 25th, and that day was when the National Urban, Rural, and Northern Indigenous Housing Coalition was formed, and quickly within less than a month after that, that's when the National Indigenous Collaborative Housing Incorporated was federally incorporated and um, recognized or created as the body to be the delivery agent that was Indigenous led and Indigenous um, governed as an organization to deliver the earned strategy. So, following that, we have the creation of Nietzsche. And to speak a little bit more about the creation of Nietzsche, I would like to pass it over to Jocelyn Formsma, the CEO of the National Aboriginal Friendship Centers. Association yes. of Friendship Centers. Associate, yes, sorry. I knew I was gonna <laughs> mess that up. <laughs> That's okay. We get that, we get that a lot. Um, I miss away. Uh, my name is Jocelyn. I'm from Moose Creek First Nation. Uh, currently serving as the CEO for the National Association of Friendship Centers. Um, and so I think um, I'll I'll maybe speak a bit to um, the NEFC's pathway to our engagement as as my story in explaining um, the Nietzsche creation. So um, as many folks know. Um, that uh, friendship centers across the country often um, provide either some type of housing support, provide housing directly, or are partners with house Indigenous housing associations to provide crucial wraparound um, services. Um, and so we've always had 
a, a, a touch on housing in some capacity, um, basically since the inception of friendship centers. Um, in places like BC and Ontario, um, friendship centers are actually members and, and uh, part of the governance structure of AMA, where, where Margaret is um, from, and, and the OAHS, um, the Ontario Aboriginal Housing. Um, I don't remember the S stands for it either. Um, so we're engaged, we're, we're there, um, and we've been aware for quite some time um, what the CHRA Indigenous Caucus has been uh, doing. And some of our friendship centers have been members of the Indigenous Caucus since its inception. Um, and when the four Indigenous by Indigenous housing strategy came out uh, that was drafted by the um, Indigenous Caucus, we were very supportive of that because it was really the only sort of housing specific um, plan that was out there um, referencing friendship centers also um, while we were working on sort of our own national strategy and um, if I could take a sidestep our engagement has been really challenging because housing obviously isn't the only thing that we do so people don't often make the association uh, with housing urban indigenous housing directly with friendship centers they think of us more as like service delivery organizations which we are but um, not really aware to the extent to which we are providing housing and providing wraparound uh, services to support um, uh, supportive housing. Um, so things kind of culminated in the fall of 2022 uh, with respect to the Nietzsche creation. I don't want to um, to repeat anything anybody has mentioned. Um, uh, Margaret already talked about um, our pillars and and the principles and the things that we're working on um but basically um with the announcement that 281.5 million dollars was going to be rolled out um it seemed to be like another process that we as indigenous peoples could oversee ourselves um but we weren't given the opportunity to have um that participation input on the decision making level except for being a, a part of the committee so we were in part of, invited to be a part of a committee that would have been rolled out um through government and that would have been fine um except we've been doing all of this background work already on Nietzsche had very capable people um to do this work people with experience for decades and I thought it would be a better um option and a great opportunity to actually um formulate what organizations have been talking about for a while so um folks met in uh November in Vancouver um, and the declaration was developed. Um, the organizations that were in attendance at that meeting um, were were the signatories to that initial uh, declaration, basically saying like, look, we're all separate, we're all different, but we're willing to work together here. Um, and then a smaller group was uh, kind of put together that, um, uh, said, okay, we're actually going to formally incorporate this organization and we're going to um, get the ball rolling on it. Um, so December, um, the bylaws were were drafted with an interim board um, appointed. And uh, since then, we've been working on a business case to demonstrate our ability and capacity to roll out uh, not just this $281.5 million, but to be um, ready to roll out much more and not just millions or hundreds of millions, but you know, even if there was the opportunity to roll out billions of dollars um, indigenous housing that is by and for indigenous peoples, um, those are the things that we're looking at. So um, we've drafted a business case that includes um, processes that we'd undertake um, and we all drew from our respective experience in, in doing our work. So even though the organization is new, we have people who are a part of it um, as members and as board members who have been doing this work for, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 40 years. Um, so the experience is deep, even if the organization is new. And within the business case, there's also, um, you know, ensuring that 
should this organization be successful in receiving um, monies, that there's a process that is fair, that is balanced, that considers the unique um, needs of large urban spaces, the small rural northern remote communities, and um, specific uh, considerations for the north in addition to other um, really important cross-cutting factors, right? Um, we're planning our first AGM in, uh, in April uh, in, in conjunction with the Congress uh, that CHRA is, is hosting. Uh, it'll be at the same time and we're putting together a save the date. We're uh, gonna be organizing stuff. So anybody who is interested in becoming a member um, can participate and have the opportunity to have input into the next steps of this organization. And uh, should anybody be interested um, to to be part of the um, inaugural board of directors, um, the interim board members aside. Um, I'll leave it there for now. Um, uh, as Kim has up on the screen, um, the so she showed the the um, principles that that Margaret had spoke to uh, earlier when she was doing her present presentation. And this map is basically um, of those folks that signed that initial declaration. These are the locations of of those um, members. And the idea is, well, one, already looking that there's such a, a broad range across the country, um, but definitely interested in making sure that um, we cast the net wide and that anybody who's interested that it's working in urban Indigenous housing um, has the opportunity to participate. Um, and in particular, you know, areas that we currently don't don't have folks. So I'll hand it back to Kim, um, unless there's anything else that you wanted me to mention. No, that's great. Thank you so much, Dawson. Um, that's really good background on the formation of Nietzsche and um, really emphasizing that the interim board of directors are just that interim along with the name. And um, it's really important to stress that it is Indigenous designed, Indigenous delivered, Indigenous led and Indigenous governed um, as an organization. And just when looking at the EARN coalition signatories, um, the red ones indicate that they were the founding 14 uh, organizations, and then the black ones were ones that had joined afterwards. Um, the only stipulation that we ask for, and this kind of goes back to why uh, Nietzsche isn't part of CHRA, is because CHRA is not an indigenous led or organization. So we ask that signatories and members are indigenous led to keep with the for Indigenous by Indigenous concept that is so very important in delivering any kind of services or programs to for Indigenous people. So with that, talking about um, the activities of the National Indigenous Collaborative Housing Incorporated, I would like to pass it over to the interim CEO of Nietzsche, Jeff Lutz. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Kim. Ani Bojo, Michigan, do dem nin dao. Mr. Sagi Ganesh Nabig in Dunjabahaya Watha First Nation. Jeff Lux and Dish Nakash. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, I guess, for some. Um, my name is Jeff Lux. Uh, I am um, Turtle Clan from uh, Hiawatha First Nation, a community here in Southern Ontario. And uh, I am acting as the interim. It seems the interim word is the catchword of the day. I am acting as the interim executive, uh, chief executive officer for Nietzsche, essentially just playing a lead role um, to help uh, the board and to help the organization itself get going and get started. What I wanted to do is uh, I wanted to touch on uh, a few of the activities that have happened or are happening and uh, give you a bit of background on some of those. And uh, then perhaps uh, when we get to the Q&A section, uh, if you have any questions about them, I'd be happy to fill in the blanks. Um, the first thing I want to touch on is something that Jocelyn already mentioned, and that's the business case. Uh, the business case was a priority document and a requirement of the Government of Canada. So obviously something that needed to get uh, completed or get started right away in order to build the case uh, for the allocation of the $300 million and eventually what turned out to be the 281.5 that would be coming over to Nietzsche. 
uh, that work started in January, and it took 11 iterations to get us to a, a point where we could call it final. Uh, after a variety of, um, of reviews and people having a chance to provide comment and input, um, various changes uh, that would be quote, be required from, from various levels. Uh, the final version was presented to uh, Indigenous Services Canada on March 7th. So we consider that business case now done uh, and solid and that uh, our case has been made to, um, to ensure that the funding is provided uh, to Nietzsche uh, to be able to, to uh, deliver on the services and deliver the funding uh, out to the organizations and the communities uh, and allow you to do the job that you are doing in helping to house urban, rural and northern Indigenous people. Um, we're now waiting for feedback from the Government of Canada. That is a process that they'll go through uh, in, in preparing the Treasury Board submission um, and in hopefully uh, having success with that, seeing the funds released to us quickly and being able to get started uh, with what we've uh, put on the paper, on paper anyway, with respect to um, the organization, the allocation process, et cetera. Um, as I mentioned, the business case and the funding that we're looking at relates to the 281.5 million out of the 300 million. 18.5 uh, million um, has been um, um, uh, taken over by CMHC or is under the, um, the auspices of CMHC, and they are developing uh, their own strategy and a separate approach for how they're going to do that. Um, but we'll be working with them as well and involved with them in those conversations. So our focus right now is on the $281.5 million and securing the operational funding to be able to get Nietzsche ready to do the work that it was designed to do, um, as well as hopefully prepare for future budget announcements that will allow us to continue the work, uh, not just on the $300 million, but on uh, additional dollars that would come out of budget 2023. Um, the other thing that's a part of that uh, business case and that we're optimistic is that government is optimistic about is that government will be able to find the operational dollars, the admin costs, if you like, that is required to uh, to help op uh, Nietzsche be operational and do its job, to be able to find that outside of the 281.5, meaning that then uh, the dollars to allow Nietzsche to do its work would not be taking away dollars that are vitally needed at the community level and in your organizations to address the needs uh, of Indigenous people who are living away from their communities. So those two things are, are important for us right now. And, um, and uh, we're glad that the business case is final in our eyes. And uh, we're very confident that that will be well received when Treasury Board gets its, uh, gets its chance to review it. Um, two other things, three other things I want to mention. Work continues right now on the developing the governance and structural models for Nietzsche, for this national center um, that uh, Margaret and uh, Jocelyn had talked about and the creation of that center. So work is underway on that front. Um, funding has been provided to, um, to do some work on what would be the organizational structure, what would be the governance structure of Nietzsche, more work to come on that. Um, more work is also underway or will be uh, required as well with regard to the national indigenous organizations, um, in this case, AFN, ITK, and uh, MNC. Um, but we're not uh, restricting ourselves on that engagement to just the national political offices. We're also looking at engaging uh, across the piece with various uh, regional, provincial, based uh, um, Indigenous organizations that represent you know, the three groups, uh, the, um, um, the, the uh, BC, uh, Ontario, uh, the regional chiefs in, in all of the provinces and territories uh, for the AFN, as well as the local or regional PTOs, um, Inuit uh, organizations across Canada, especially those that are south of 60, as well as dealing with or addressing um, and reaching out to um, the Indigenous organizations in the north. And then, of course, working at the various community and regional provincial levels with uh, the Métis um, uh, organizations provincially, as I say, or locally. Um, that work is important. It's a requirement uh, of part of uh, the discussions with Canada, and it will be something that we will, uh, we will carry out over the next little while. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, what was mentioned by Jocelyn earlier, is the uh, gathering in Winnipeg. And we are looking for um, a good response of people interested in attending that day. It will be a hybrid event. So you'll be able to, if you can't attend Winnipeg in person, we will be sending out over time here 
uh, ways in which you can connect, you can register and connect uh, and link into the discussions uh, at a distance. Um, the date for that is Monday, April 17th in Winnipeg. Um, it's the first day of the days that have been set aside for CHRA's Congress. Uh, the Monday, the 17th is the Nietzsche gathering. Uh, the Tuesday, the 18th is the Indigenous Caucus Day. And then the following two days are the CHRA Congress um, and their uh, separate agenda around that. Um, we are um, encouraging you and um, everybody that you know who might be interested in, in being a part of that to, uh, to participate in the Nietzsche gathering on the 17th of April. Um, right now, there's just a save the date that's being circulated. So you'll see something if you haven't already that talks about saving the date for it. Um, more information will be coming on how to register for it. Uh, there's no cost to register. Um, so it's not something where we'll be looking for a specific fee from you for that. You'll see more details on it with the agenda and uh, guests, uh, keynote speakers, et cetera, over the next few days. So please um, save the date, mark that in your calendars and, and plan to attend either in person or virtually. Um, part of that day is also the first AGM of the new Nietzsche organization. And in that AGM, uh, the main uh, function of that will be to um, elect, uh, nominate and elect a new board. Uh, as has been mentioned, the current individuals who are part of the board for Nietzsche are all sitting in an interim capacity. The intent is to um, hopefully find representation from across the country, coast to coast to coast, uh, of people who are interested in being on the board and being members of the board. Uh, a package will be coming out in advance of the AGM to be able to give you some background on what's required for the nomination, uh, how many seats would be available, et cetera. But um, if you're interested um, in participating, if you're interested in becoming a member of, uh, of Nietzsche, I would encourage you to, to seek out the For Indigenous by Indigenous website. Um, you'll find there an opportunity to join Nietzsche. And as I say, stay tuned. There'll be more information coming on the uh, April 17th Nietzsche gathering in Winnipeg. There are a whole lot of other moving parts, of course, that are happening when it comes to um, starting out a new organization and creating a new national entity. So a lot more work is happening on various fronts to help to put uh, the new entity in place. And as I say, uh, get it operational and get it rolling. Um, but over the next two or three months, our most important uh, focus is on being prepared and ready to deliver on the 281.5 when that comes from government and then building a, a longer term um, lasting structure for Nietzsche to be that national center that has been spoken about and is urgently needed and, and, and necessary in order to provide the services and supports that you so importantly and you so urgently need. I think I'll stop it there, Kim. There's a lot, as I say, a lot of stuff happening, and I'm happy in the Q&A to be able to take anybody's uh, questions or concerns. Hi, Namik. Thanks so much, Jeff. Yes, and a lot of work has gone in very in a very short amount of time in the development of Nietzsche. And to speak a little bit more about what that looks like, um, I would like to introduce David Seymour. He he's the chair of Nietzsche and can talk a little bit more about the vision, not only in the immediate short term, but also for the longer term. Um, strategy, and he is going to speak about the three vectors of Nietzsche. So, David, I would like to pass it over to you. I... Uh, hello? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Uh, I'm Seymour from uh, uh, the uh, unceded territory of the Squamish, Slavitooth, and uh, Musqueam, and uh, uh, share with you come to share with you the development of Nietzsche um one of the things that was uh important for those first to uh hear this uh some of you just learning a lot um is that once the declaration was made everybody and his dog wanted to talk to us and wanted to be part of the discussions on various fronts so in the first meeting in early December, we uh, were in, embroiled in, in about six different conversations, which became just chaos. And so as a consequence is 
I uh, realized that there's really three different scenes or processes that were at play. And I used the word vector versus project because the they were both, all three required uh, an, a dynamic ongoing process to, to an ultimate end. The first one is the organizational development. The government of Canada is expecting uh, us to do that and not them. They had insisted that they would not, in fact, support the um, organizational uh, incorporation costs, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the costs of communicating with you in the initial stages, but they would support us getting together, such as their, um, uh, for various other reasons. And so the first of the three is organizational development, and we have been doing that internally and and uh, um, uh, in, in in a multitude of directions. Uh, one is uh, making sure that everybody is a part of the um, uh, the uh, the declaration by becoming the signatory of it. I will be presenting a a process where you can be considered a founding uh, member. Um, at, a, at a small cost so that we could, in fact, cover the cost of the incorporation uh, legal fees to do that, uh, as the government did not. The second uh, vector or action is to get the $281.5 million. As you've already heard, it, it comes out of the budget 2022, and it and it is uh, diminished from the 300 because CMHC took off the top 18.5 million. And, and they're using that money to do consultation. Um, and a portion of that is supporting us to do some consultation. I'll speak to that later. But as uh, Jeff explained to you, the, um, the, the 281 is in fact left. We, uh, using our principles, using where we came from, have been consistent that the uh, ISC position of, of making us into some sort of uh, advisory group was rejected and completely uh, set aside in favor of us being given the whole of the 281.5 to deliver uh, to the, uh, the sector. The third... Uh, Seymour? Sorry to yes. interrupt. I'm not sure if you had intended to have your camera on, but it I, is not. You've locked me off. Oh, the camera? You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Yeah, I, you might have to try a couple times. That happened to me as well. Oh, I, I've been trying to turn and it on. No, it worked. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. sorry about that. <laughs> I, anyway. So the third vector is, in fact, the uh, uh, it, it, the long term. When you read the the uh, the budget of 2022, the 300 million uh, uh, in defense of the federal government was simply to develop a sustainable uh, investment in the sector. Um, it is the first time since the uh, creation of the national housing strategy that the government of Canada has recognized that that. There is a gap. Uh, uh, I uh, um, would like to refer to the gap as being much like the uh, Jordan principle concepts that you can't turn around and say, "Oh, this is provincial jurisdiction," or "This is this is First Nations jurisdiction," or "This is Métis jurisdiction." It in fact becomes a gap of services for uh, because of the the nature of the. Uh, people that we deal with. Uh, as, as everybody on the front lines understands, you don't uh, check a status card, a Métis card, or an Inuit card uh, when somebody comes to the door. You address the, the sector by way of need, and you understand that it, it is uh, the, the need first and, and, uh, and, and status second. And so all of those distinct-based uh, uh, processes that the federal government did under the uh, national housing strategy leaves the gap for the kind of services and programs that we deliver. And our third vector here is to ensure that the coming budget on March the 28th has in fact 
uh, uh, a clear allocation uh, that in uh, will carry us into the future uh, and and become a sustainable um, um, national housing strategy addressing the urban indigenous housing in the longer term uh, and, and a sustainable and sufficient funding. Uh, we've already taken the position that uh, the housing advocate has said we should be given $6.3 billion in this sector. And so our goal is here. I want to uh, compliment uh, Jeff's comment that we need as many people in Winnipeg as possible because under the vector one, we, we're dealing with, um, we've incorporated a basic model We've created an interim board. We've created an interim uh, set of articles and an interim purpose is su sufficient su to deliver the 281. Uh, we want to open it to the members, um, uh, the then members to evolve something greater. And as Jeff uh, uh, already uh, stated, and I repeat, um, there's work being done on, on a governance model and um, there's a uh, an expectation that the membership would endorse a, a a governance model there. It's it's not one of the things that is so both exciting and challenging is that we have come to the table um, uh, with a long standing both experience and cause um, and 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 purpose, and uh, we've been met with relatively open arms but uh, uh, a lot of work to do. Um, so um, we'll leave it there for questions so that we can deal with uh, others. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you so much, Seymour. And thank you to Margaret, Jocelyn, Jeff, and yourself for uh, taking some time to talk a little bit more about Michi and the history of the Indigenous Caucus, which has all led to the point where we are right now um, I would like to remind everybody, if you have a question or a comment, to please leave it in the Q&A function of Zoom. And um, at this point, we can open it up to answering some questions or hearing from you on what your thoughts are on the EARN Indigenous Housing Strategy and perhaps even the delivery of the $300 million. Um, I have a question here. This would probably be for Jeff um, and perhaps Seymour or Jocelyn. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the delivery of the 300 million or rather the 281.5 million and what that looks like? It's Jeff, I was going to give that to Jocelyn or Seymour because they were part of that allocation model discussion. Okay. Oh, let me take that because it's um, the, uh, um, there is like competing um, interests that we, we must make sure. These are the three competing interests. We want to make sure there is um, uh, the broadest opportunity for everybody in the sector. So, one, we want to touch base with everybody. And uh, the suggestion was to do two-stage process. Uh, and I called it a, um, uh, an invitation of need or uh, uh, as opposed to um, uh, a letter of interest, uh, rather, uh, what do you need and, and, and what kind of timetable? Um, there is the uh, objective, the second objective that is critical is that um, that the allocation be uh, comparatively spread throughout the whole of Canada so that we don't favor uh, all of those projects in BC or all of those projects in in, in some other region uh, it's it, it's got there's got to be a kind of a diversity the third is that that we want to uh, achieve uh, the, uh, the goal to fund those in need now. Like it's, uh, um, we don't want to uh, uh, be funding something 
that won't be delivered in 10 years. Uh, we want to find something that will be uh, so that we can show success with this uh, resource and, and seed those guys who are got great ideas and need funding so that we can support the, the vector three, the long-term investment in the category. This here is like a test ground in that sense. And so we uh, want to ensure, so, so the three vectors is, Everybody should have an opportunity. Um, the money should be allocated uh, um, uh, broadly uh, as best we can uh, uh, without, without having uh, a predetermined dedicated amount for each of the regions, like you see under uh, many of the its programs where they, they, they say, oh, you got this population, so you get this much. No, no, the goal, the priority goal is to, to see housing uh, on the ground as quickly as possible. And so we want to see those uh, projects uh, that have uh, the closest to starting or already started and needed to get something over the finish line. Does that help? Yeah, I'll just add quickly on um, to those points. Um, like uh, Seymour said, there's nothing really, um, you know, this much to this particular um sector or or that but um but kind of a, a matrix with um the decisions being made by a technical advisory committee that hasn't yet been established um but the idea is that those are going to be people that have an expertise that are representative um and that uh don't have say a vested interest in um the applications and just to make sure it's a a, a fair and accountable and transparent process. Um, and then uh, again, like no specific list, but things looking at balance between large urban centers, smaller rural areas, Northern communities, balance of project sizes and scopes, such as new builds, renovations, you know, different, different types. Um, looking at uh, the indigenous populations that are served. So First Nations, Métis, Inuit, um, but also uh, women, elderly, to us LGBTQ plus single adults, families, people with disabilities, um, geographic location, the cost of living, um, the readiness of the applicants, um, as well as uh, you know what the budgets are being asked for. Is it is it mostly for operations and maintenance, or is it for materials? Is it you know new builds? Those those kinds of things. So. Um, it, Basically, uh, we're trying to keep it as flexible, or I th our thought is to keep it as flexible as possible um, so that everybody has the opportunity to make the case, knowing this money isn't going to go very far. But um, the idea is just to make sure that the process is fair and that there's an ability for a wide variety of factors to be considered. I, I'd like to come back and compliment uh, Jocelyn on the um... Uh, uh, the notion that it is a lot of this is uh, is uh, crystallizing uh, like um, uh, it's coming together uh, as you've just described. But some people might want to know what is the timetable, and so we've made ours uh, as as Jeff has already said the business case has been made to uh, ISK. ISK is presenting that to Treasury Board, the date the Treasury Board makes its final decision on it is April the 20th. And if you uh, look at uh, ISC's processes, it's something in term about 60 days after that, that we would start to see actual money in a bank account. Uh, so part of the process in April is to become money ready um, uh, and to have a, a an organization in April. Um, uh, April, May to to receive that so that we can put in place those final um, uh, crystallized uh, concepts that uh, Jocelyn and I have shared because um, the, uh, they're both um, components to how this uh, un unfolds. And so we're looking at uh, a, 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 a summer delivery kind of thing but that is you know, I, I, I'm only guessing, but we're, and we're working as hard as we can to get things happening, but that's the kind of timetable, realistic timetable. Thanks. 
Timur. So uh, we do have a question and it's kind of two parts. Um, the first part is, is the funding coming out of France or mortgages? And couple with that, uh, one of the systemic barriers that we have is that one old housing stock with no funding for repairs and also lack of land. Um, UPIP and CMHC do not provide this type of support. So would Nietzsche support these types of projects? Thank you for that. When you look at the three vectors, um, the reason for um, uh, creating the three vectors was to understand that there's themes um, in the vector two, the delivery of the 281.5 million, uh, we want to sort the projects that are deliverable right now to those that are deliverable uh, in the longer term so that the, the needs that are identified uh, in trying to deliver the 281 will then become this is, uh, the support for the longer term. Well, we've worked uh, politically hard, uh, uh, practically hard, and, and, and in our consultative processes that are ongoing, we expect to get, um, uh, there's a target of being uh, before the cabinet, before the end of June, to uh, have the long-term vector dealt with. And, and in that sense, uh, dealing with all of those projects that in fact cannot uh, in practical sense, be delivered right away. In the initial discussions on the 281.5, um, the uh, ISC wanted it delivered in seven months. Uh, we said you can't quite do it all in that. And, and so we've stretched it out and, and got um, permission to deliver it over a two-year period. Um, but we want to use it as our... our um, our uh, demand or uh, uh, need assessment for the longer term. So that's how vector two feeds into vector three. And, and in that sense, uh, part of it will be, uh, one of the things that I uh, want to emphasize is that in Winnipeg, when we have the meeting, uh, there, there is a session that I, a uh, consultative session on what the third vector would look like if you had the opportunity of creating it yourself. And, and in that sense, capturing all of those little nuances. Because we found in our uh, informal discussions with uh, signatories and, and uh, potential members and, and others that there is a significant diversity of need right across Canada. Thank you. You see more. Uh, we have a question that Margaret would like to answer. Um, Margaret, so what federal department will the funding flow from? Oh my goodness. I think I'm having technical challenges here as well. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, and, and, you know, I think you saw Jocelyn kind of smirk. I think I started laughing out loud. Um, for those of you that, that don't know uh, the work that we've undertaken and since November 25th, I think has averaged three meetings a week uh, between multiple levels of, of the federal government. Um, right now, we're negotiating with, with Indigenous Services Canada and Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Uh, and I believe that the primary right now for the 281 and a half million is coming through Hadju's office, so Indigenous Services. Yeah, if I could just add on, and, and even the previous one, um, we we don't yet know what the um, limitations are with respect to land. Yeah, it, it, that seems to be an issue with us too about being able to purchase land. So we'll have to um, kind of take those components into consideration. Um, and I don't want to jump ahead, uh, Kim, but just on the which department, um, I think that also goes to this question about who's designing the earn strategy. Is it CMHC or Nietzsche coalition? Um, because what we found is um, that there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of players and things are happening simultaneously um, and trying to keep track of it all has 
been I pretty much feel like I've had like a part-time job on top of my full-time job if not like two full-time jobs just trying to manage all of this um, and I think there's um, CMHC as far as I understand it still has the responsibility for um, the oversight of the government uh, urban northern and rural uh, indigenous housing strategy that's a government-led um, piece um, that being said Indigenous services is only um, rolling out this immediate $281.5 million. Um, that's only for urgent and kind of shovel ready projects. And the idea is that the earned strategy will be the bigger picture, longer term um, strategy. Um, and then where we are, are looking at fitting in is actually, um, you know, there was already the for Indigenous by Indigenous uh, strategy. There's, you know, with, with AMA and with OAHS, um, there's uh, strategies that they have for their regions, but there's also been a lack of capacity in other regions. So you might have the odd urban Indigenous organization that's been doing housing in some capacity, um, but they're not necessarily affiliated with a larger group that's at a regional, provincial, territorial um, basis. And so um, part of the work that we see Nietzsche doing um, initially is is to really, and, and it also kind of goes to the question of membership, right, um, is making sure that um, there's always going to be a capacity building component or um, some kind of supportive model um, for Indigenous housing providers or Indigenous organizations that are providing some kind of um, wraparound support um, related to housing. Um, so I guess the the, I hope we've, I've answered on on those specific questions about the department, but in terms of like membership and where it's going, things are very fluid. Um, there's a lot of players and um, if it seems <laughs> kind of confusing, it's because it is a confusing situation. And um, there's been a lot of people working on it, trying to make some sense of it and trying to communicate that um, in, in a way that people can, can understand and, and making sure that, people aren't being left behind. Yes, exactly. And thank you, Jocelyn. And I really do want to emphasize the incredible amount of work that volunteers like Jocelyn, Seymour, Margaret, and Justin, um, the interim board members of Nietzsche have done all at the sides of their desk while running organizations. And Robert's, uh, Robert Byers, uh, um, recognizing that they understand the importance of the work that this is and have undertaken it without any support. And until uh, Jeff was hired as the interim CEO of Nietzsche, there hadn't been any um, full-time support for the development of all of the activities that you've heard from us um, in terms of submitting the business case and meeting with the government officials, organizing everybody's schedules that had all been done voluntarily by um, the interim board of directors and in some capacities from CHRA. But to recognize the amount of work and the accomplishments that Nietzsche has made since its incorporation in December, we're sitting here only in the middle of March and um, have really, come very far in achieving so much. Hi, Margaret. Um, I don't know if you wanted to sit, add on to that. Oh, no, she's saying goodbye. Um, unfortunately, Margaret does have other um, obligations to attend to. She's very busy, as we all are. So in moving on. Um, before, we, before we move on, it's important for people to know that the 281.5 is uh, definitely coming from ISC, but the third longer term sustainable investment will be determined by the cabinet um, after um, uh, the budget has been announced and approved. And so that's um, uh, uh, yet to be determined. Uh, the hints and, and possibilities is that this might um, as part of uh, uh, of, uh, of CMHC uh, is equally on the table as ISC is on the table. But anyway, as, as Jocelyn points out, there's a lot of moving parts and, and uh, uh, like the weather, you, you want to keep checking. 
Thank you. I think just moving in on a slightly different direction and Jeff, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit here. And it's the question about um, being have, having support to attend uh, the AGM next month in Winnipeg. I know that um, nothing is completely finalized yet, but maybe you could speak a little bit about the idea behind being able to support various organizations to be able to be a part of that. Thanks, Kim. Um, as I mentioned, or as everybody's actually talked about as well, is uh, the amount of work that's gone on in a short space of time. So um, I've started in this job early in February, so about a month into it, and a lot of things are happening and a lot of things underway, and, and the Winnipeg gathering um, is a very important piece of that. Um, we're putting the budgets together for that now as we speak. We're a little delayed in getting some of this work done, and it's, I think, only because we didn't get started at it uh, in, until later. But one of the things we're looking at in the budget is how we can support uh, some of those organizations across the country who don't have the funds to be able to maybe attend, who have uh, lower budgets or lower levels of funding and aren't able to uh, pay for this all themselves. So what we're trying to factor in is a way in which we can support uh, a modest number uh, of uh, organizations to be able to attend in Winnipeg. Um, our hope is to be able to provide them uh, on a basis across the country. Uh, and so we'd look at it across the regions. We'd look at it um, um, east, west, north, um, and various um, um, geographic areas, et cetera. But the intent would be to try and, and provide funding for some of the groups. We can't obviously make this uh, um, a broad um, funding approach because we don't have the money to be able to uh, bring everybody uh, in and pay for it. So uh, just stay tuned. There will be more information coming out in the actual package itself. We hope to have the registration details and information on the agenda within the week. Um, there'll be an information in there or a section in there uh, that deals about raising your hand uh, if you have a need for funding to support you being able to attend. The other reason, um, the other thing, sorry, that we've done to help with that um, is to create a hybrid event so that if you can't make it, if you can't get out or there isn't the funding available to allow you to uh, to get out, um, then then join us virtually and uh, and be part of the conversation as well. You'll be able to not only watch, but also participate. So you have a chance to have a voice as well. Um, I know that uh, Seymour has made a comment about talking to your local politicians. And I'm, I'm guessing that that's something that uh, people can approach or can, uh, can talk about uh, at your local levels. Um, for now, as I say, uh, we hope to be able to fund some organizations. I can't say how many yet until we go through the budgeting process. I hope to be able to be able to, to, be able to provide support of some uh, nature to allow people to actually physically come to Winnipeg and be part of the day. Yes, that's. Um, I wanted to uh, in a small time period. <laughs> I wanted to. Uh, um, that, that, to there's a comment in the uh, question and period there uh, uh, from Roger uh, about going to the survey. Um, we had discussions with the uh, CMHC on the survey. Uh, uh, and they gave us the opportunity to comment on their survey. Um, we were critical with in that respect, but um, uh, made some general comment. Part of the uh, funding that um, we've got to date uh, or currently is to actually consult with the sector on how to make a, the new long-term program. And so one of the um, the questions that will uh, ultimately be asked of, uh, of everybody in the um, in Winnipeg um, will be this and so I'm I'm this is a uh, uh, like a trailer to a movie uh, your your window uh, when I do the interview matrix and so if you're coming to uh, uh, Winnipeg and I hope you do come to Winnipeg um, put your mind to this when you're um, traveling. From your, this is the question, from your experience and knowledge, if you were inventing or creating a new program 
to support housing in this sector, our urban, rural, and northern sector, what elements or parts or processes would you include in that program to ensure the support of the Indigenous uh, uh, by Indigenous uh, uh, concept? And um, in that sense, we're doing our own to invent uh, our own uh, uh, program. Uh, it's running parallel with CMHC, but it is not, um, uh, it will be asserted later uh, as being the better of the two. Okay. Thank you, Kimberly. For Seymour, and just a reminder to add questions into the Q&A section of the Zoom function. Uh, it's hard to follow the chat when there's a lot going on. So if you have a specific question that you would like answered, please use the Q&A function. Um, we only have one here, and I'm not sure if we'll be able to answer it, but um, the question is, what does projects that have been marked as waitlisted under CMHC shelter and transitional housing, what does does projects that are shovel ready? I'm not, I don't think that we have the capability of answering that, but it, does anybody want to give it a shot? Well, that's, it's interesting because if these, uh, the obvious question that would be asked is um, uh, if it's marked as on a waiting list, then it should be by definition ready to go. And, and the curious question is, uh, what are they waiting for? Uh, if it's waiting for CMHC to fund it, then, then uh, let's uh, knock on CMHC's door. But if it's mm -hmm. waiting for funding, this is the kind of project that would be uh, put into the 281. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me, uh, I'm not sure if that's, uh, I mean, you can never answer uh, that kind of detailed question on a, on a panel like this uh, without getting much more detail to it. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, at this point, like everything is so new and, and being in, develop, in development that um, nobody's going to say yes or no to anything. So if folks are thinking it's a good candidate uh, once the process comes out, then yeah, I think um, folks, I mean, if, if the proposal is already done, there's really nothing to lose by tossing uh, the, that proposal in. And um, and then it would just be up to the, um, the advisory committee um, that's making those those recommendations to um, assess amongst with the other proposals. That's exactly it. So we have a question here. Um, and this is a really good one because we are looking forward and what are the best things everyone can do right now to help drive a positive budget outcome from cabinet in support of Nietzsche and housing earn indigenous families. Um, we know that the budget announcement is coming up March 28th. That has been confirmed. So um, we're running out of time to get our voice out there. So any suggestions here on the on the crew on how to best do this? Well, I, I've already answered it in the uh, the uh, in the chat or in the questions. You, you write your MP, even if it's just an email or a card or uh, something that says, I, I, su I support Nietzsche, I support the funding of this sector. Uh, uh, I support the uh, um, or Indigenous by Indigenous uh, strategy, uh, or I support the national housing strategy being extended to ensure that that the urban, rural, and native and northern uh, sector is covered by funding Nietzsche. Uh, uh, any of those kind of comments uh, um, or stories. That's the other uh, thing. Uh, I have a family that can't get housing. Uh, uh, describe the need to your MP. Make sure that they're alive to the demand. Uh, that's critical in my mind. Yeah, and I think this is something that we had discussed, and Jeff, maybe you want to speak about this, but what exactly the 
what the act ask is and what it means. And I think that as Canadians, if they hear that there is an investment, whatever the investment is, however much it is, it will look like it's a lot, but we need to really um, emphasize what the actual ask is and why it is that amount. Um, Jeff, did you wanna talk about that a little bit? I'm just uh, clearing all the blocks here. Um, yeah, I can and just quickly touch on it. And Seymour has mentioned it as uh, as well. Is it basically making sure um, we talked the other day about? Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times uh, when when the, uh, the average person, if you will, looks at a budget ask of six point three billion dollars um, or billions of dollars, their immediate reaction is uh, is hard to get around their heads around those kind of numbers and to understand what that means. And the assumption basically is, how can you ask for that kind of money? What exactly is it going to do? Why do you need so much? Why can't you make do with three hundred million instead of three, four, six billion? Um, and I think that, and to Seymour's comment, that's where you need to be able to explain to individuals, especially MPs and especially the average public, um, the majority of the general public, is what's behind those numbers. What is the need? What are you describing that you're trying to deliver and that you're trying to address? What are the various concerns and issues that people are facing in urban, rural, and northern communities that aren't being recognized or don't get recognized when people think? talk about those dollars. They only talk about amounts. They don't talk about what the outcomes are. And if you can describe, uh, as Seymour suggested in your conversations with MPs, particularly the MPs right now, uh, in order to get behind the budget, but also just to the general public to make sure they understand exactly what it is that you're talking about when you describe um, the extent of the uh, the issues, the extent of the problem, and, and the extent of the needs in your communities. And so um, I would encourage you to have those kind of dialogues um, wherever you can um, so that people appreciate and understand just exactly what it is. They can read the numbers, they can read um, strategies and reports, but you can bring that home on a much more uh, personal and at a much more community level than, ever, than can ever get captured in a, in a national report or in a budget release. Very good, thanks, Jeff. So I don't have any more questions, but I wanted to just ask the panelists here on their final thoughts, if they have anything that they would like to share when it comes to any of the three vectors, uh, the organizational development, the, the 281.5 million, or the long-term uh, sustainable investment in an earn Indigenous housing strategy. And I'll start with Jocelyn. Um, well, I think we've pretty much said everything, um, except it's, you know, we all know that this is long overdue and there's been um, attempts pre previously to try to get something like this off the ground. Um, I think the timing is right. And, um, you know, there's really no opportunity like we have right now. And so we just want to push as hard as we can to, um, to get things moving. Um, I always say that, you know, we are looking for opportunities to give our work away. And so I think we look forward to the day when Nietzsche is like fully up and on on its feet and doing all of the things that it needs to be doing. Um, and and really there's so much potential. Um, it's, it is a lot of work, but, you know, I have full confidence that we will we will see this happen and that we'll see um the the work on the ground continue and um yeah i'm just i'm excited and i'm really uh hopeful that we can we can get it over the finish line i think there's an end in sight somewhere hopefully <laughs> i mean if not let's meet about it <laughs> yeah um i'm just kidding so seymour did you have any final thoughts I was trying to um, get it uh, very simple. Um, and the the best I can do is that November the twenty fifth was um, was a uh, 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 best described as a like the Big Bang Theory. Um, the whole of this sector is obvious. The need in the sector is obvious. The the call that we've done for the last uh, to quote just uh, just to 
30 some odd years. Um, uh, I joined uh, the call at the national level in 1994, and we've managed to, to um, you know, call and call and call and be part of various movements. But today, the the uh, like like a, a house on fire, uh, everybody is needed to put a, a to deal with this. Um, and I and I'm so inspired by by the uh, the sharing and the and the caring that is around the table of Nietzsche that it um, it's important that we keep it going and uh, um, and we we actually accomplish. Uh, the the goal it, it, so important that that we um, not only get a structure uh, but a strategy for the whole of the sector and it um, and we're so close and yet uh, it's uh, anyway I um, come to w Winnipeg and let's uh, let's really uh, inspire the whole of the country. To know that, that uh, who we are and what we're doing. Yes, thank you. Um, Jeff, did you have any final thoughts? Um, I just um, I think I want to echo, obviously, all the sentiments that have been expressed by Jocelyn and Seymour and pick up on a remark that Margaret made at the very beginning about the need to be united and to come at this with one voice. Uh, I've been involved in Indigenous housing for 45 years. Uh, somebody earlier on the chat used, uh, Louise used the term watershed moment. Um, there, is other, there are other adjectives that I'm sure that, that come to mind. But for me, this is an opportunity that can't be wasted. Uh, this is an opportunity for, for all of these organizations, all of these individuals to come together, to be united, as Margaret described, and in one voice, make sure that government is listening and understanding uh, what it is exactly that you need, what it is you expect, and to um, and to stand up and 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 talk and shout loudly about it. Um, as I said, forty five years of, of my life in this field, there have been times when I thought um, change was going to happen. There were times when I thought I would see a shift. Um, this is that moment in forty five years where the shift could be seismic. And it just needs everybody to come together with that voice to make it happen. So I'm encouraged by what I'm hearing and 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 by the um, the response to this. Um, I'm um, amazed at the work that the um, the interim board has done and the staff in behind that, that oftentimes we forget that in behind also uh, the Justins and the Jocelyns and the Margarets of the world, there are staff that are also um, um, supporting all of the work that happens here as well. Uh, and it's helped to make that happen and helped to make it move over the last four or five months. So may um, wish to them for all of the work that they've done and uh, may wish to everyone else for the work that you're about to take on, hopefully, and and carry on as we move this thing forward. Thanks. How, Jim Gretsch. In the meet, Jeff, I think like that sentiment to thank everybody and ask for some patience. Um, as you may see, the for Indigenous by Indigenous.ca website will be handed over from the Indigenous Caucus to Nietzsche. It just needs some work. So there will be a space there with upcoming events. And that will be the, the hub of information sharing um, to be soon. Um, and any information will be shared on social media, on Twitter, and just be patient with the information that we is that is getting out there. Not having a whole lot of um, staff or 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 resources to get this work done. Um, your patience is really greatly appreciated, and to recognize the work of everybody that has put into from the beginning up until we are today and looking into the future all of the work that has been done and will continue to be done so looking forward to what's next but with that I think we're going to wrap it up for today I'm so grateful that you've spent some time with us here today and thank you for all your questions comments and as Jocelyn Jocelyn had said um continue to reach out to us. This should be a community-driven and inclusive um, 
way forward. And we are always grateful to hear from you and hopefully see you in Winnipeg next month. So with that, I will end the webinar and put in the meet. Thank you so much.